Welcome to the introduction to Cyber Forensics Lecture from the University of New Haven's Cyber Forensics Research and Education Group. Now, before we start this lecture, I want to make sure that the audience understands that the lecture will not make you a certified digital forensics examiner by any means. And this lecture is really just designed to provide a simple introductory level outline of what the digital forensics investigation process is. Our goal is to understand and define what cyber forensic science is, perhaps list the basics of a cyber crime scene procedure, and understand what to do when a computer is on or off on a crime scene, or maybe when a phone is on and off on a crime scene. Comprehend the handling of evidence as you find them on the crime scene, and understand the three A's that are critical to our domain, which is acquire, authenticate, and analyze, and understand the process of maintaining the integrity of evidentiary data, and gain insight into what to do if that data is encrypted. Now, cyber forensics is about science and law. You cannot have forensics without having science and law together, intermingled. And it's about the scientific examination and analysis of data that could be held on or retrieved from computer storage media in such a way that the information can be used as evidence in the court of law. Now, what's important is that you understand that this is a process. It's a process that could be sequential. Sometimes it's not because every case is slightly different. But generally speaking, we have a process in which we identify evidence, we collect the evidence, we transport the evidence, we analyze the evidence, and then we report our findings. Whenever we identify the evidence and we collect it, the main thing here to keep in mind is that we're doing it in a scientifically valid way as well as in a law-abiding way. Because if these two things, again, don't exist, then we're really not doing forensics. Now, one could think of a digital crime scene as an actual digital crime scene on a server, or it could actually be a normal scene, like a room, that contains digital devices. And that's the thing that maybe differentiates this area of forensics from other forensic disciplines, is that we could actually have a virtual crime scene in which digital evidence may exist in. The main thing here is that digital evidence is data that establishes that a crime has actually been committed. And digital evidence can provide a link between a crime and its victim, or it can provide a link between a crime and the perpetrator. Now, there are numerous types of evidence that are digital in nature. They could exist on numerous kinds of devices. We have things like mobile phones, hard drives, gaming systems, USB sticks, you name it. Almost everything that you use in your daily life could contain some sort of digital evidence. We have to keep in mind that we can find certain evidence that is not digital that may relate to a digital crime scene. In essence, you might go into a crime scene and you might find a password that is hidden under a keyboard on a sticky note, and that might enable you to crack the hard drive's encryption, for example. So one of the things that we have to keep in mind is, although there is digital evidence, it is not the only source of evidence. However, statistics have shown that almost 90% of all cases have some sort of digital evidence associated with them, and that means that this field is very important. So when you get to a crime scene, and you secure it, and now you're about to get the digital devices out of it, you might face situations in which the computer's off or the computer's on. In the past, we were always told in this domain that you should unplug the computer from the back of the computer, not from the wall, in essence, so that you know exactly what you're unplugging. And it doesn't matter whether the computer was on or off, but now things have changed. Now we are really facing a challenge in which we get to a computer, and if the hard drive is fully encrypted, we might have to acquire memory. And we'll get into that in the next slide. But the main thing we have to keep in mind is, if the computer's off, we really have to document it as much as possible. 
and follow some sort of procedure that's similar to what we're portraying here in the lecture slides. And what's really critical is to maintain the chain of custody of the evidence as you take it from one place to another so that you understand who, when, and where had this evidence at any single point in time. Now, also this is changing sometimes in, in our field where we're conducting what we call digital forensics triage. But ultimately, the old school way of doing things is you take this device back to a forensic lab and then you do the analysis. And when there's no time, you might have to do the analysis right there on the crime scene. One thing to keep in mind is you do want to remove the hard drive from the system. You do want to document all the USB peripherals. And that's whether the computer is on or off. Those things are very, very necessary. Now, if the computer's on, the main difference here is that you want to disconnect from the network because you don't know what's happening. However, it is of note that if you are investigating, let's say, a server that's owned by Amazon that's doing a lot of transactions and making a lot of money, you really do not want to take that computer offline. So we have to be sensitive to the nature of the crime or case that we're dealing with. And the main thing right now that's being pushed very hard in our field is acquiring RAM, random access memory. See, the thing is, when you switch your computer off, the data on your hard drive stays there. However, the data in RAM, and that's really what you see on your screen, plus many other things, is deleted. In the past, people have said that this data is deleted immediately, but some research has shown, for example, the cold boot attack research has shown that actually the data fades over time. It's not deleted immediately. But however, if the data is not gone, there might be some very sensitive things in there that we might want to capture. For example, encryption keys, chat messages, or something that will not be on the actual hard disk itself. So you still follow the same procedures. However, disconnecting from a network, acquiring RAM, and getting the computer to a state in which it's forensically viable to take back to the lab is very, very critical. Now, the other set of devices in which we see a lot of these days are mobile devices. And again, they could be off or on. And mobile devices or small-scale digital devices are kind of tricky to deal with because a lot of people have passcodes on them. Uh, with Apple's new iOSs, they are quite secure and it's very difficult to get into the phones as evidence in the recent FBI case in 2016. But one of the main things is you have to document the crime scene, but we also use sometimes these bags called Faraday bags. And Faraday is a kind of metal that basically shields the connectivity to the phone. Some research has shown that a lot of these bags that are being sold are actually not that viable for usage, but let's be better safe than sorry. When the actual phone is on, again, you have to document the crime scene, but a lot of times you'd want to put it in airplane mode so that you shield the connection, and you'd want to insert a portable charger. And part of the reason why you want to do that is because you might you know, lock the phone up if you turn it off completely, and you might not be able to acquire it. And by acquire it, we mean pull the data off of it, which we'll get to in a minute. So those are the sort of things that you have to keep in mind. Now, a lot of you, when you look at this, you might be saying this is only applicable to criminal cases. That's not true. In any case that you work on, you should really approach it as if it's a case that's going to go to the court of law. Because you never know what's going to happen with that evidence, even if you're investigating something inside your own organization. Because you could be hired as a forensic examiner for a company and you're only working on corporate cases. But the thing is, that data might sometimes reach the court of law. And unless you've done things in a forensically sound manner, then you're not really doing your job correctly. Now, once you get back to the lab, there are three things that you'd want to do. The first thing is acquire the evidence. So what a lot of us do is we create what we call a bitstream copy. Let's say you have a hard drive. I want to create an exact copy, bit for bit, of that disk. As an examiner, I would work on the copy and not the original. Okay, I made a copy. How can I make sure that this copy is an exact copy of the original? And that's why we have this thing called hashing. Hashing is really an algorithm. It's a one-way computational algorithm in which you take, let's say, some data, and then you apply the algorithm to it, and you get a signature. Now, 
the signature will change if one bit changes in the original data. This means that if I take a hashing algorithm and I apply it to the disk, the original disk, and then I apply it to the image that I've created and they match, then I know that this is an exact match. And that's what we mean by authenticating the digital evidence that we have acquired. And lastly, we want to analyze the data without modifying it. And again, this is why we perform an analysis and we attempt to find the digital evidence we're looking for on the copy that we've created and not the original. So when you're taking out a hard drive from a system and then connecting it to a workstation and then using that workstation in order for you to make a copy of it, you would want to use what we call a hardware write blocker. A hardware write blocker is basically a device that prevents you from writing to the media that you're acquiring. By media, I mean a hard drive, and only allows you to copy data from it. The main thing here to note is when you're using a hardware write blocker, you should test it. You should test it before using it every single time you're performing an acquisition because you want to make sure and you want to do the due diligence as much as possible to ensure that you're not writing any data to the disk once you are acquiring it. So I did mention a bitstream copy earlier on, but a bitstream copy can be done in two different ways. It could be a disk to image or a disk to disk copy. Now, a disk to image copy basically means that I take the full disk, I use a program, one of the most used ones is FTK Imager, and I would acquire the disk and I would create a bitstream copy that then turns into a file or a bunch of files. And now basically my disk becomes a bunch of files. A bitstream disk to disk image is basically I have disk A and I have disk B and I connect them to this device and it copies disk A to disk B and now I have a copy of disk A. Now, when you are configuring a hardware write blocker, nonetheless, in order to do your acquisition, you have a couple of cables that you would have to connect to it. You have the power cable, the computer cable, and the device cables. In this picture, as you can see, the hardware write blocker is powered on, it's connected to the SATA hard drive, and write blocking is enabled. And all of those indicators with green are on, illustrating that it's in a functional state. Now, when I perform the imaging, what's very important, as we talked about the computational hash, is the process of doing that. So, in essence, I have a disk. The first thing I want to do is hash the disk. Once I'm done hashing the disk, then I create an image of the disk. Once I'm done creating an image of the disk, then I hash the image of the disk. Now, when I'm done, I compare the hash values. If the hash values match, I know for a fact that I have an exact clone of the disk. Now, looking at this picture, this is what FTK Imager produces at the end of the acquisition stage. And what you could see is that the hash values match for the MD5 hash, the SHA-1 hash, and MD5 and SHA-1 are basically two different hashing algorithms. SHA-1 is more secure than MD5, but they're both used widely by examiners. Now, I've acquired the data, right? And it's time for us to analyze it. And this is where we would need various different tools. But you have to think about this for a second. What if I acquired a disk that was fully encrypted? That could be a potential issue, right? And this is going back to what I was saying before. If you find a password on a sticky note, that might be the password that would enable you to defeat the encryption on a disk. So what's really important to note here is just because you've acquired the data does not mean that you gain access to it automatically, right? What you have to really focus on is if the disk is encrypted or if the data that you're looking at is encrypted. So let's assume that the data is not encrypted. Then you would start analyzing it and you would use various different tools to see the data itself. Now, 
there's a multitude of tools that are widely adopted in industry for analysis. Autopsy is an open source tool that we use extensively in our lab. It's great. It does most of the things the tools used in industry can do, and it's free, so you can download it and play with it. The other tools that are widely used are Access Data Forensic Toolkit as well as Encase. There are a variety of other tools, but this is beyond the scope of this lecture. When we're looking at mobile phones, things get a little more complicated because with hard drives and with media like desktops and laptops, that media is standardized to a larger extent. When it comes to mobile phones, for the longest period of time, there was no standardization. There was USB ports, mini USB ports, Apple has its own ports that plug into the phones and so on and so forth. So when it comes to analyzing mobile phones, there are a variety of tools that you could potentially use. And the most widely used ones are XRY and Celebrite. There's also Oxygen Forensics, which is also widely used. And there are some open source ways of being able to acquire data from the mobile phones themselves. For example, Android Debug Bridge can be used to pull data from an Android phone without purchasing any software or hardware for that matter. So the question then is, what are the different ways you can get data from a phone? Now you have to understand when you're dealing with phones, they are quite volatile. Data on a phone is changing all the time, specifically when it's connected to the network, and you're carrying it around with you all the time, getting phone calls, SMS messages, pictures, that has a GPS unit on there, accelerometer. So data is really moving very quickly inside of a phone. So there are different ways you can get data from a phone. The first way, which should be used should you have no other choice, is what we call manual acquisition. With manual acquisition, you simply take the phone, and you record it with a camera, and you show what evidence you can find on it. Sometimes that's really your only way of getting data from a phone. The other way to do it is to perform logical acquisition. And by performing logical acquisition, you're really getting a bit by bit copy of the files and folders, but you're not getting any of the deleted data that could potentially be on the device. The other way to extract things is what we call a file system acquisition. This really acquires things that are marked as deleted in a database. It could be important for web browsing and application usage. And lastly, we perform physical acquisition, very similar to what we talked about when it comes to hard drives, and that is a bit-by-bit -bit copy of all the physical storage on the device. And this is really the only type of acquisition that can recover deleted files. So here's an example of an XRY unit. It has an authentication flash drive for licensing reasons. It has a computer cable that's connected to it. It has a device cable and it's powered up. And you can plug a phone in there and then you use the XRY software on the workstation and you start acquiring the devices. Here's an example of the user interface. Should you be able to acquire the phone, you can click on device, see the device details, the contacts, the web, if there's any websites that were visited, the files on the phone, and so on and so forth. So we have covered a bunch of concepts here about acquisition, mobile phones, hard drives, bitstream copies. But what's really important to note at the end of the day is that evidence collection has to be done in a way that protects the data. It is also important to note that documenting every little thing that you've done throughout the whole process is super, super, super critical. Should you have any doubts or should anybody else have any doubts about your work, you have your notes to go back to. And the chain of custody of everything that you've done or every single item that you've collected is also very, very critical. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture. And now it's time for you to immerse yourself as a digital forensic investigator and engage in a virtual reality case to help you practice what you have learned. Thank you and good luck.